want to talk a little bit about um, vaccination uh, today and, and uh, the risks of uh, vaccination with um, <clears throat> what some people will try to sell you as, as nature's vaccine. So you, we've talked a lot uh, over the course of the last two years about um, <clears throat> theories of, of natural immunity and herd immunity, and you've had a, a number of um, very prominent voices um, advocating for natural immunity as the best protection against uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, and, and we talked about the Great Barrington Declaration and a, a number of the folks that have been advocates of that. So um, again, just to, to caution people to take a pause about this exuberance for natural vaccination. So this idea that uh, Mother Nature is the best vaccine, this uh, live non-attenuated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, uh, which obviously is COVID-19 being infected with the actual virus. And we know that we've had over 80 million Americans with documented uh, COVID-19, uh, so infection with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the true number is probably uh, more than three times that, as we've discussed. Um, and we, we know that that has resulted in over uh, 880,000 uh, or 980,000 uh, fatalities. So, so that's, the, um, that's the result of getting natural vaccination, right? So infection with SARS-CoV-2. And what we're learning now more and more is it's not just the data around hospitalization and it's not just the fact that almost a million, well, certainly more than a million Americans uh, in actuality have died because of uh, natural vaccination. <clears throat> um, but we're learning uh, every day more and more about other long-term complications that come from infection. So uh, a couple of studies I think that are worth highlighting. This was a study that recently came out in the British Medical Journal uh, from Sweden. Uh, and so this was uh, a, an analysis of the Swedish public health database uh, looking at infections between uh, the beginning of the pandemic, February of 2020 and May of 2021, uh, looking at people who had been infected, comparing them to age-matched, uh, sex-matched, and location-matched controls, uh, and then looking at whether there was uh, an increased risk of clot or bleeding uh, disorders within 30 days after their COVID diagno diagnosis. They also took those patients who were diagnosed with COVID and did essentially kind of a self-matched control period where they looked at the period of time just before uh, they were diagnosed with COVID uh, several weeks and then more than 180, 180 days afterwards to see if that period of time from diagnosis of COVID to 180 days was also associated with a higher risk when they compared to the actual same individual. Uh, so this is that self-control period. Again, you can see they, uh, they did a buffer period where they didn't count the 30 days before just in case they had undetected COVID infection, uh, but they compared the period before and the period after. And then here is the match controls and they did a four to one uh, match. So you can see this is over a million cases uh, in the Swedish database of people who were diagnosed with COVID-19 and looking at the risk for developing uh, clots, uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, or bleeding disorders. And what you see here is a massively increased risk of clotting disorders and bleeding, uh, but primarily clotting disorders associated with COVID-19. You can see that uh, about a five times higher risk of developing a deep vein thrombosis within 30 days after being diagnosed with COVID-19 compared to controls, and then a 33-fold increased risk for developing uh, pulmonary embolism. So that's a massively increased risk uh, compared to uh, people who did not have a diagnosis of acute COVID-19. And you can see that uh, in absolute numbers, or at least um, uh, a, a rate, it was about uh, 1,700 cases of uh, DVT per million uh, for people who had just recently been diagnosed with COVID. So remember that number, 1,700 per million in the first 30 days after COVID diagnosis. Um, if you remember, the, the biggest concern that people have had with uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been the, this thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome, where we've had patients with uh, significant clotting disorder uh, after vaccination with J&J. Uh, but if you look at that rate, uh, for the 18 and a half million doses of J&J, &J, there have been 60 confirmed cases uh, reported uh, to the CDC. So that's 
three per million. Now let's say even if we were underestimating that by a hundredfold, so the true incidence was actually 300 per million. Uh, again, this is just making that up, assuming that we're not catching all of the true uh, TTS cases that, that are occurring with J&J &J vaccine. That's still comparing a rate of 300 per million for the vaccine to 1,700 per million based on this Swedish study, right? So there's no comparison in terms of the risk of clotting from the vaccine compared to the risk of having de of developing significant clotting disorder uh, after COVID-19. And this risk is very closely tied with how severe the disease is. You can see, though, that even with uh, very mild disease, you still have a significant increased risk, almost sevenfold increased risk of pulmonary embolism uh, and a threefold increased risk of DVT compared to people who don't have a diagnosis of COVID-19. For those admitted to the ICU, you can see you almost have a 300-fold increased risk uh, for pulmonary embolism for somebody who's that sick. So again, the, the data are clear. Natural vaccination gives you a much higher risk of developing severe, potentially life-threatening uh, clotting disorders. Uh, and that happens at a rate that's probably uh, many tens to hundreds of times uh, or more what the risk is with uh, the, the actual vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, almost zero risk. The uh, adenovirus vaccines, the J&J, &J, uh, is the one that has risk. And again, no comparison in terms of the risk. The second study I want to point out is a study that looks at long-term anatomic injury that's sustained after diagnosis of COVID-19. So this is a study that was published out of Austria, looking at uh, <clears throat> a relatively small court, 90 patients uh, who they were able to do serial follow-up CAT scans on after a diagnosis of COVID-19 up to a year. So you can see they did scans at two, three, six months, and then a year after diagnosis. These were all folks uh, 18 years and older who had a diagnosis of COVID-19. It ranged from mild uh, all the way to severe, and then they followed them up. You can see about a quarter had very mild disease, so outpatient treatment. Uh, about a quarter had hospitalized disease but didn't require any oxygen or other respiratory support, so they called this moderate disease. And about 25% had need of oxygen and, and about uh, roughly 25%-ish or so uh, required ICU hospitalization. Um, <clears throat> and at one year, you can see that over half of these individuals still had uh, significant detectable abnormalities on CAT scans. So normally we think of people who have pneumonia, uh, their uh, radiographs and CAT scans usually resolved after uh, weeks to a couple of months, uh, but by a year you wouldn't normally expect people, uh, unless they had severe uh, pneumonia, uh, to have uh, a lot of residual scarring, but that was not the case with COVID-19. And the risk was greater in those over the age of 60, those who had more severe disease and, uh, and males uh, more than females. And here are some uh, representative um, images that they show from these CAT scans. And you can see that um, at, you know, even on uh, kind of the low resolution images uh, in a journal where those arrows are, you still have significant residual um, scarring uh, and abnormalities in the lungs uh, on CT uh, after uh, a year, which is the far right panel, uh, C, F, and I. And if you look at those uh, risk uh, Ratios um, on the right, you can see that it's um, related to severity. So the more severe your COVID, the, the more likely you're gonna have uh, more residual scarring. Uh, and again, age and sex are the other uh, pretty significant risk factors that uh, were associated with more scarring. The last uh, study I want to talk about, uh, looking at the uh, long-term risks of uh, natural vaccination, uh, or COVID-19 is a study that came out in the Lancet, diabetes and endocrinology, looking at the risk of uh, new onset diabetes <clears throat> post-COVID. Now this comes from the same folks, uh, Z and Al Ali, that have uh, analyzed the, the US VA hospital database uh, and have given us um, studies looking at long-term cardiovascular complications and neurological complications. So pretty much the same cohort con uh, control study. So looking at 181,000 veterans who were, diagnosis, who were diagnosed with COVID-19 of all ilks from mild to severe, and then looked at two control groups of about 4 million each. So a, a huge study looking across the whole VA database. And what they found is a shockingly 
uh, increased risk of new onset diabetes in patients uh, who'd had COVID-19. And this is for the year after initial diagnosis. Now, you know, the, obviously the caveat is this is going to be uh, people who were diagnosed over a year ago. <clears throat> so it is mostly the original um, virus um, and, and maybe a few cases of, of Delta. Uh, this does not include a lot of Delta cases and it certainly doesn't include any Omicron cases. So if there's differences there, uh, that may look different uh, in the coming year. But for um, the original strain of virus, uh, alpha and some delta that were mixed in in the US, uh, there is clearly a, a much higher rate of diabetes uh, after COVID-19. You can see it's about a one and a half fold increased risk uh, overall, and a, about a two fold increased risk of having to use an antihyperglycemic. So that means diabetes significant enough to require medical treatment. Uh, that is uh, a giant uh, increase in, in risk overall when you think about it. And it also seems to be associated with the severity of disease. So you can see in people who required um, um, hospitalization and intensive care, their risk went up. And so the risk of uh, uh, either diabetes or increased hyperglycemic use, you can see is almost it's between five and six times uh, for people who were uh, in the intensive care unit. And so when you look at the overall impact of that, first of all, their conclusion uh, you know, says it was pretty clear that COVID-19 is associated with increased risk of incident diabetes in the year after, uh, and that this risk was associated with severity of disease, but even so, the risk was not trivial, not trivial among people who were not hospitalized for COVID-19. So even for people who had mild cases of COVID-19, their risk was elevated. And then if you look at how this translates into the population, this would result in an estimated over eight per thousand additional cases of diabetes in the population at 12 months. And you think about that over you know, the entire population of Americans who've been infected with COVID-19. Again, that true number is, is probably over 240 million. Uh, and you think about globally, the number of people across the world who've been infected. And, and again, that true number across the world is uh, several billion at least. Uh, that could potentially uh, result in a huge burden on health systems if this holds to be true, that we have that dramatic and increased risk of diabetes after COVID-19, and that's generalizable across multiple populations. Um, so again, it's not just death and hospitalization, that natural vaccination or infection with COVID-19 uh, gives us in terms of problems. It has potentially very long-term and very substantial implications for population health and burden on the health system for years and decades to come. We know that diabetes is associated with uh, a slew of, uh, of complications, vascular disease, uh, coronary disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease, kidney disease, et cetera. Uh, and so the burden from this could be uh, dramatic. Uh, the last thing I want to point out is, <clears throat> um, again, despite the news that we see uh, uh, mostly on a daily basis, COVID is not over and certainly not over here. Uh, for the first time in a while, we're starting to see an uptrend uh, nationwide in the U.S. You can see that the slope of that curve now of our daily cases is definitely on the way up, uh, and that is primarily uh, for states on the East Coast, but you can see there's a large number of states that have had a dramatic increase uh, in daily COVID counts over the last two weeks. Um, if you look at <clears throat> regions one, two, and three, so again, region one is uh, New England, region two is um, <clears throat> the New York, New Jersey area, and region three is mid-Atlantic states um, down to Maryland. You can see that all of those are showing increasing trends in case counts here uh, over the last two weeks. Um, this co coincides or correlates with the dominance of BA2 now. Uh, you can see that that light colored uh, band coming down from the top at the, at the very far right represents uh, BA2 cases. And although that's 14% of the cases over the last two months, over the last two weeks, um, that appears to be well over 70% uh, uh, of cases nationwide. And, and we have poor resolution really over the last week to 10 days. So and we're probably uh, much higher than that. So BA2 now clearly predominant and, and by a week or so is probably going to be almost all of the isolates we have in the US. We have in the US. And that's correlating with uh, dramatically increased risk. And now finally, uh, we had that bit of a head fake a couple of weeks ago from uh, the wastewater 
um, surveillance data, uh, looking at rates where we had a bump up, we had a bump up, really gone back up here over the last uh, three weeks or so. Uh, this is nationwide data over the last six weeks, and you can see a dramatic increase, more than doubled uh, since uh, uh, mid March or so. And then uh, looking regionally, you can see that uh, greatest in the Northeast, but all regions are showing uh, an increased trend in wastewater detection of SARS-CoV-2. So it looks like this is the BA2 wave that's uh, finally here. Uh, again, we had a little bit of a head fake early in March, but now it looks as if this is uh, truly the, the increase uh, related to BA2 that we had expected. Last thing I think always important to keep an eye on and, and watch out is events in China, which uh, continue to grow. Uh, exponentially, their case numbers obviously uh, centered in Shanghai uh, with uh, massive numbers of cases there. But um, <clears throat> if you look at where their peak was back in February of 2020, uh, they had uh, a peak case rate of uh, under 5,000 cases per day. Now they're uh, essentially at 25,000 per day and they are rocketing up. So China has lost control uh, of, uh, of BA2. Not surprising given that this is a virus that probably has uh, a, uh, an R-naught that's about four times what the R-naught of the original virus was. So just uh, impossible to keep this completely under control, especially in a population that has uh, not great uh, overall immunity. Uh, and so uh, keep an eye on China because things are going to continue to get worse. Uh, that's all I have. Thanks, Shelley.